everyone. Welcome to Water of Life Church tonight. As you can see, Tom's not here. He is um, celebrating with his niece and nephew on, on their 25th wedding anniversary. And so rather than um, cancel church altogether, we decided that I would share a short word with you tonight instead. So I'm very nervous, but I'm hoping that what I share is going to be um, worth uh, worth listening to and that it will actually um, be an enjoyment, enjoyment for you to listen to as well. So what I want to talk about is two different things, although they are, I guess you could say they are opposites. One is grafting and one is pruning. Both of these situations need sharp tools so in lots of ways they're similar but in lots of ways of course they're very different so let's look at pruning first the, the dictionary definition of pruning is plants are pruned to promote vigorous growth or to induce prolific flowering or fruit some shrubs are pruned to make them a certain shape if a plant is pruned when it is small, it gives the plant a low framework that makes it sturdier and better able to withstand storm, storm wind, winds. The tools need to be kept sharp and clean. This of course is also a biblical principle. And in John 15, one to two, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it will even be more fruitful. In these verses, the fruitful branches are cut back to promote growth. God must sometimes discipline us to strengthen our character and faith. Branches that don't bear fruit are cut off at the trunk because they often affect the rest of the tree. Jesus is the vine and God is the gardener who cares for the branches to make them fruitful. We are the branches. God the gardener is fully committed to bringing us to maximum fruitfulness. God's pruning benefits us, it doesn't threaten us. I remember as a child watching my dad prune the trees in the garden. He had a huge garden and both my parents were very good gardeners. And I remember this particular day, I mustn't have been too old because I was quite shocked to see that one of the trees as he pruned it all this sap ran down the side of the, the tree. And I commented to Dad that he'd made the tree cry. And he laughed and he said, you watch, you watch and watch and watch. And he said, this tree will grow better, produce more fruit, produce more flowers, and its shape will even be better. And of course, that's what happened as I watched and waited. And then as I grew older, I thought about the fact that the tree doesn't ask the gardener to prune it. The gardener knows the right time and when it is time to prune the tree. And of course, that is what our Lord God does for us as well. He knows when it's time for us to, to be pruned. We don't ask for that. He, he just does it. And it's an interesting concept that God will do for us whatever he needs to do to benefit us in our lives. <clears throat> all, of our, all of us through many situations in life have de developed into what we are today, but we're not the people that Jesus planned for us to be. We've been um, tainted by the world. Our carnal nature, natures have changed us into what we are today and so God needs to, tr to prune those things that we've been tainted with away from our lives so that we be can become more Christ-like. I know we won't see that that work completed until we're reunited with him in heaven but we can certainly allow him to work in our lives now. He is willing and able to do anything for us but our fears and dislike of pain will often stop the process. There will be tears, but it will be worth it to become the person that he 
he has meant us to be, he has made us to be. One area in, in my life where the Lord has been teaching me about pruning is in my attitudes, not only to my about others, but to myself. And that was quite an eye-opener. I always focused on the external difficulties and the things that people had done to me, whether they hurt me or whatever in, in my life. And I often found it difficult to forgive those people for what they'd done. And on the realisation that it's my responsibility of how I react, not their irresponsibility, that I have to be take responsibility for my actions and, ha and my attitudes. And so I asked the Lord to help me to forgive a number of these people and, and he helped me to do that. But then I realised that my attitude towards myself wasn't healthy either. And the fact is that it is important to have a correct attitude towards ourselves as well. By putting ourselves down, we are doubting God's love for us. We need to remind ourselves every day how special we are to Jesus. In my case, the Lord gave me a revelation of how much I was loved by him. And if you suffer like I did, ask the Lord to reveal something to, to you of his great love. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do not realize, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless of course you fail the test. We need to look for a growing awareness of God's presence and power in our lives. If we are not taking active steps to grow closer to God, then we are staying still or drawing further away from him. We need to ask Jesus daily to show us where we need to change and then ask him for his help to make that change. In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God uses his life-giving, life-changing word as one of his tools to prune us. And as with the trees in the garden, he uses a sharp tool. We need to immerse ourselves daily in his word so that it can shape our lives. It will show us the areas where we've gone astray and help us back on the path where we should be. In Philippians 1.6, it says, Being confident of this, that he who begins a good work in you will carry it unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus' return. God won't give up on us. If God starts a project, he will complete it. We mustn't allow our present condition to rob us of the joy of Jesus and growing closer to him. I often get discouraged about different attitudes and things that I have in my life and I think, God, what's going on with me? But it's true. He has started a good work in me and he will complete it. And I've got that confidence that no matter what happens, providing I keep my eyes on him, allow him to do the work in my life that he needs to do, that he will complete that work. And one day I will see him in heaven and hopefully he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I just want to share a poem um, from a book that I read as a teenager. It's called Minka and Margaret. They were missionaries to Thailand in 1963 and sadly they were martyred in 1975. But Margaret wrote this poem not long before that time and I just think it's interesting. It puts a bit of a spin on what I'm saying. She says, Why, O oh Lord, the heartache, the emptiness, the darkness and the loneliness? Why the disappointment with others, the circumstances, and most of all with myself? Why is it, Lord, that I don't see your face, hear your voice, feel your love? And the Lord answers, My child, you do not know now, but one day you will. Trust me, even though you cannot see my face, hear my voice, feel my love, 
because your senses are dimmed, it does not mean that I am far away, that I don't care, that I'm withholding my love. I would have you remember that through suffering, he was made perfect. By the things that he suffered, he learnt obedience. As I dealt with my son, so I deal with you. As you trusted me, so you must trust me. Remember, my child, you walk by faith, not by sight. With your eyes on me and not on yourself or others or circumstances. Through this time, trust me, child. Trust me to refine, to strengthen, to perfect. Trust me to make you like my son, my beloved, in whom I delight. An incredible testimony of God's staying power with these, these women as they were, she was actually being held as a prisoner when she wrote that. And as I said, they were martyred not long after. So it's even in the most difficult situations, we know that God is with us and we can trust him to do what he's going to do in our lives and watch over us. The other side of the coin is grafting. And this is a, an interesting thing. Grafting is the process of joining two plants together as one. I've noticed that some of my roses will change colour back to their rootstock if the graft doesn't take. So a lot of my roses, if the graft hasn't taken, turn, return back to their original red colour. They, they, they seem to graft a lot onto red roses. A lot of you may know that we have fruit trees here that grow oranges, lemons and limes on the same tree. I'd love to get one because it fascinates me, but it's an interesting thing that people can actually graft different tree, totally different trees onto the one branch. A lot of you know that I was adopted. When I was adopted, I was grafted in my, into my new family. I was no longer Beverly Hazelgrove, but Kerry Nichols. As a Nichols, I inherited all that belonged to my new family. It's the same when we give our lives to Jesus. When we are grafted into his family, we also inherited everything that he has for us to have. We're no longer a child of the world, we're a child of the King. And as such, we can ask him for anything that we want, providing it is in line with his will, of course. In Romans 11, 19 to 22 from the Message Bible, it says it is certainly possible to say other branches were pruned so that I could be grafted in. Well and good, but they were pruned because they were dead wood and no longer connected by belief and commitment to the root. The only reason you're on the tree is because your graft took when you believed and because you're connected to that belief nurturing root. Be humbly, mind, humbly mindful of the root that keeps you light and green. To graft something onto a plant, you first have to take an extremely sharp knife and cut a deep wound into the tree. Again, it's going back to the similar story of pruning where the gardener uses a sharp knife and makes a deep root. This is what Jesus did for us. Jesus had a spear thrust deep into his side so he could be grafted into his family. Jesus was willing to be deeply wounded for us. This is something that we can't comprehend. To make a successful graft, the plant to be graft, grafted has to be completely removed from where it previously flourished. You cannot keep a connection between the old plant and the new. It's impossible. Sometimes we try and cling to the world, which is a symbol of the old plant, as well as clinging to Jesus, the new plant. This can't work. We have to let go of the world and totally cling to Jesus. Jesus told us to give up everything and follow him. For example, when Jesus told Peter to step out of the boat, he was asking him to give up everything he relied on, for support and to trust only in his connection with Jesus. Peter couldn't cling to both. He couldn't hold on to the boat and walk on water with Jesus. Being grafted into a relationship with Jesus means being cut off from all that we cling to, for safety and trusting only in his word as we follow behind him on a path that only he can see. As Tom has shared with you a number of times with our missions work, we don't know 
we never did know where God was going to lead us, but we were willing to say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. We, we understand that you've called us into this role and we will follow you regardless of what we can see and regardless of what we, we know, we will trust you to take us and lead us into that path. And that's what we've done. We've been on an incredible journey and I wouldn't change one day of that time and looking forward to many, many more times as well. I read this and I thought it summed up this really this idea really well. Write your name on a piece of paper. Take hold of your Bible to represent Christ. Place the paper in the book and close it. You are now in Christ. Where the book goes, you go. Where the paper goes, Christ goes. You are not part of that book, but you are now adopted or grafted into that book. So it's an interesting idea that wherever we go, that Christ is with us. It, it gives a really strong picture of, of us being with Christ and that we don't know where that book's going to go, but Christ is leading us and taking us to where he's going. In John 15, 4, it says, Abide in him if we are to have real life. The graft, which is us, can do nothing without the nourishment of the stock plant, which is Jesus. Only in Jesus can we be secure. Only in Jesus can we find safety. Only in Jesus can there truly be life. This is going to be rather short tonight because that's basically all I wanted to say. But I just wanted to make a couple of other comments. And that is, if you are one of those people who have known Jesus and have, for whatever reason, stepped aside from that, that knowledge of him where you perhaps got one foot in the boat, one foot in the world, one foot in Jesus' camp. It doesn't work and it never will work. You'll never be happy. You'll never feel the contentment that you can if you are fully grafted into Jesus. And so I'd just like to challenge you if, if you're listening and to really reassess that. Ask Jesus to help you to cut off that worldly part of it and that you will be grafted totally back into him he will do that for you he loves you he wants you as I've said before to to be completed in him I think the most saddest people in the world are those that have known Jesus and then stepped away there's never that real complete contentment in their lives anymore and I know that because I've stepped away as well and at times and knowing Jesus is the best thing that you could ever do and so I know that you can't respond to me on here but if you'd like to send me a message or come a message and just ask us to pray with you or to give you some more advice feel free to do that if you are connected to a, another believer that you can see in person or a pastor please do that as well I just want to encourage you that it is so so important especially in these last days to get your lives right with God and to follow him to the best of your ability all of us make mistakes all of us mess up but providing you're totally grafted to Jesus and do your best with his help, then you will be in a much, much happier place. So I just want to finish with this prayer. Precious Jesus, thank you for the privilege of being your child. Thank you for your love and your patience as you wash, watch over us each day. I pray, Jesus, that you'll open each of our eyes to see where you want us to grow and help us to have enough faith in you to allow you to make the changes that are necessary in our lives. Amen. I pray that this has encouraged 
some of you tonight and that even though it's short that there's been something there that's been beneficial to you and I just thank you for joining in and just encourage you to join in again next Sunday when Tom will be back and I just pray that you'll have an awesome week. God bless you. Bye.